the advice at the time was use whatever framework you like. And then but in those days, it was quite a few, right? It was Dojo, Tools, jQuery, EXT. And so there was no one set proposal. That's Chris Gray, a principal software engineer here at Salesforce. I'm Josh Berg, a developer evangelist with Salesforce. And here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down with Chris to hear a brief history of JavaScript frameworks as they've been used at Salesforce throughout the years. There, he is starting out in the very early days of Classic, before words like lightning and framework were ever used together. In those days, it was a bit of Wild West of options, but Salesforce itself often used a solution called XJS. The, the big thing was is that we paid them a bunch of money to support us. And in enterprise, that always gets you a huge foot up, right? Even though everything else was free and open source supported, we could always call Sencha and say, hey, we're having this issue. Also, it had some really complex tools that were really important to Salesforce, such as the enhanced list view. So list views were like one of the kings, right? And EXT had an amazing one. And it had things where you can click on it and edit a cell for inline edit. It would get a little red triangle to show you that it's changed, which you could save back. And so we thought this was going to be the next big thing for us is getting these grids and EXT components driving our UI. And obviously at this point, right, we're doing page to page, which is still how classic is. And some of the features are going to be more long lived. And so you'll go to like the page layout editor or chatter and and you kind of do all your work, and then you go to a new page. But we already have this ambition where we're going to try to spend more time on a single page, which is eventually what we came to with like. But the EXT, that was their mission, right? They have a single page, a bunch of components, you just swap it, and have this high interactivity. Now, Chris is describing a fundamental shift in web application design that was gaining strength at the time, page-to-page applications versus single-page applications. Now, single-page applications are fairly common these days, but to make them work, you need a framework that understands how to render based on components, which wasn't nearly as common back then. I think back then it was largely like Dojo had a UI component framework. jQuery wasn't really even taken off, and there wasn't a whole lot of component options. There was mostly things that you would buy and, and set up in your framework, and you have to have the license key or something. So not a whole lot of options. So Salesforce is centering around XJS because of good support and a very rich, highly interactive interface. But a key component, you know, no pun intended, of web application design is a quick loading interface. XJS is offering a lot of power, but at a price. So EXT Core is small. It's like 50K or something, and it loads quickly, and it gives you the basic stuff. It's essentially an, another version of jQuery, right? And you see all of it has all the components in it. So if you need to have a list view or drop down, you need to pull in EXT all. And that was kind of like a meg of JavaScript or something like that. And as you can tell, the performance of loading that every page you go to was quite extensive. We were hoping for pages in you know, 500 milliseconds second range, and any page with EXT all on it was basically impossible to do that. Especially back in the IE7 days, where we're still even supporting IE6 at this point. So we have EXT all, and at some point we're like, okay, we have EXT, and now they've come with a new version and it's got all these great features, so we need to upgrade to the next version. And in doing that, we had to go through finding compatibilities between the previous version and the new version, change those if possible. Usually we could change them. And then we had to just check it in. And then everyone who used EXT had to retest all of their features. Long story short, difficulty with versioning a library beats out support, and the desire for a less bulky framework wins out over a highly complex interface. Thus begat Lumen, an internal project at Salesforce to have its own framework for building out user interfaces. So my first role was actually on a team for Caltivities, is what we called it, calendar and activities and events. So um, the good old tasks and stuff like that. And so when I started, they said, hey, you're going to do this new thing. It's a pro- propose a meeting button. And when you click it, you're going to get this dialogue, kind of the same thing you get in Google Calendar or it's a mix of doodle and just kind of the, the general calendar activities now, right? But they said you're going to do it in Meridian, which was the precursor for Lumen. And so I had a very early on 
interaction with the JavaScript frameworks at Salesforce, uh, trying to build on these new, what eventually became light. Now, if Meridian's not familiar to you, don't be surprised. It was never externally facing. Neither was AccentJS, which is a JavaScript library Chris wrote, which is also just an internal tool. But Meridian would have an evolution in both form and name that would eventually turn into the Lightning Component Framework. But it took a while to get there. There was a point where we had the, the code, like Boomin was the code word, or the, the working name for a long time. But we knew that we weren't going to go public with that, especially considering there was already another framework called Boomin that was trademarked, and they had the Boomin. And so we said, OK, we put a poll out on our internal chatter, and we said, what should be the new name? And the poll chose Bloom. And Bloom's a nice name. It, you know, it, it was OK. And then a guy went through and renamed the entire framework, like a thousand files had to get touched. And then when Benny offered the name, it's like, no, that's not it. That's not it. And so we had to go through the process again, get in higher levels of marketing. And so then we chose Aura, and then he had to do the name again of another thousand files. Now, a brief moment of silence for every developer out there who's ever had to refactor thousands of files thanks to somebody in marketing. Oh, and I want to point out that clearly between Lumen and Aura and Lightning, somebody in marketing really wanted this framework to be named after something light-based. But speaking about making things light, there's a bit of a side story here. We keep talking about making JavaScript more efficient, making the pages more efficient. But of course, JavaScript is only one of the aspects that is used in rendering your web interface. Another really important one is CSS. We hired this other evangelist, uh, Nicole Sullivan, who at this point is writing OO CSS, and she's kind of selling these concepts that we need to be writing CSS this way. The tag, these class names that are utilities, we don't need classes. Uh, we should have classes that mean something. It was a lot more dependent on the mixture of markup and CSS than what was before, which is you just describe what you're doing with CSS and then in the CSS file, you would change it. And that's particularly important for us because we found once we've optimized a lot of pages in a classic or Aloha uh, Salesforce, most of the performance penalty on these pages ends up being CSS. As people have like, quoted to me, CSS never tricks. It only grows. But hey, this is an episode about JavaScript. So let's bring it back to some JavaScript. We, we knew that with this problem, right, we couldn't grow and scale by adding more and more CSS to the page, regardless of how many JavaScript optimizations we do. So she comes in and she's got this framework of, of CSS, which is pretty much solving this problem. And she writes something for us called Zen, which realistically is a precursor to SLDS. It's kind of a slimmed down version of that. And this CSS framework, it allows us to start ripping out a lot of the portions and using this base framework CSS. But then we're in a meeting and she looks to me and goes, Chris, when are the components ready? And I am wondering what she's talking about because no one at this point has talked to me like I am the component framework or component guy for OOCSS. I'm pretty starstruck by Nicole at this point. And so I, I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll start that immediately. And so I go off and I write a little framework, a little component framework for Accent. And I start writing some components to match the, uh, the framework that she's written. And so at that point, we have a few things like a drop down, maybe some buttons, uh, like a, bu a bubble hover kind of thing for this uh, framework. And using those, like this little accent framework and this little component framework of uh, CSS or Zen, we're able to like start migrating Salesforce towards the standards and light CSS frameworks and really get it really performance. Now, that phrase of trying to get Salesforce under the standards, it's, it's really important for what's happening with JavaScript frameworks at the time. You can kind of see a consistent theme here of less being more. But that less is dependent on the browsers being able to do things for themselves, things like event handling and understand how the components are actually being rendered. And so as the standards are changing, Salesforce is also still trying to get its own component framework up and running. And so here we have Aura as kind of the this next generation visual force replacement, while at the same time, we're trying to keep up with those standards. 
its kind of vision and focus was really around maturing Visual Force, which was the API of the customers at that point, into a, hey, now you have Visual Force, one single page app with amazing JavaScript, and it's all ajax -y. And that isn't the concepts that are going to get us to the place where you mentioned, which is to be disconnected from frameworks. And to even external frameworks, we're still not we're not disconnected from them yet. So as we're going through and we're doing this framework, we're moving all of Salesforce onto Lightning and Lightning components. And what we're teaching everyone is actually, here's how you write Aura, which is all new to everyone, right? And as the web changes and as the browsers mature, we have to now constantly adapt Aura and its inner workings to kind of leverage those features and take advantage of those which is not really where Accent was going and where we ended up going with like components. Which brings us to the current iteration of JavaScript with Salesforce in the form of Lightning Web Components. And remember that the, the goal here is to have the thinnest possible layer of JavaScript talking to the browser than anything specialized that we need to work with Salesforce itself. And this goal is ongoing. And remember, it's, it's kind of in this conflict zone of trying to work with browser compatibility slash incompatibilities and still changing standards. Well, we're starting to get now the benefits from them in just the frameworks that we're developing. And then if we need something uh, particularly important to Salesforce, it's just security, right? We can't have you running your component next to a credit card author and having his component there on the page in the same DOM, because then you can just reach over and grab that information to your component. Well, we need that. That's with, without that, Salesforce can't do its platform, customize it, install packages, and so we we have to support some uh, Lightning Locker to do that. But Lightning Locker obviously needs to be watching everything that you do. It's going to uh, inspect all the APIs and make sure that you only have access to the properties that are exposed and the DOM elements you created. And that was obviously very expensive. But if we can encourage the, the web standards to that this is important for the web, that they should move in this direction, at some point it'll just become a browser feature and we can just put an attribute on the page, remove Lightning Locker, and we're done. And that's our show. In under 15 minutes, Chris and I have given you a brief history of JavaScript frameworks with Salesforce. Now, I also want to just tack on a quick epilogue here because it occurred to me while talking to Chris that every chapter in this story is built on good intentions. They were all trying to solve a problem they're having at the time. So XJS, I'm sorry, I also should point out, I keep saying XJS. Chris kept saying yeah, EXT. In the Accenture community, there's a little bit of a disagreement as to which is the appropriate pronunciation of XJS. Chris is definitely more of a JavaScript expert than I am, so I will concede to his pronunciation. Unfortunately, it's just sort of an old habit of mine. But getting back to XJS... It was designed to try to solve the problem of the Wild West of frameworks, everybody using Dojo or jQuery or trying to pick all of these things uh, to pick a good horse that was going to be robust and interactive for Salesforce users. But then Aura is a response to that because it is bulky in terms of download size, and it is also difficult to maintain. So Aura would give us a framework that we owned that we could maintain the versioning of and also try to keep as slim as possible. But then in response to Aura, we have Lightning Web Components so that Salesforce can start leaning and using the power and the efficiency of pure web standards. And so all of these solutions are trying to solve the problems that came before them. And it's important to point out, this is complex because many of these problems are occurring in parallel. They're occurring at the same time. And so there's definitely some overlap that's going on here. And because of that, there are a lot of different events and a lot of different people who have been involved in this journey along the way. And we will definitely try to get those people interviewed for you on the podcast. Now, before we go, I do want to point out that a couple weeks ago, you listened to uh, Adam Rodenbeck, and you might have heard Adam's very 
uh, epic journey that took him from one place to another in order to get his job at Salesforce. I won't spoil that for you if you haven't listened to the episode. But here we have Chris. And Chris is a, a native of Alaska. And he was working for his father who owned an ISP. And so Chris kind of turned into his de facto web developer. And in order to get into the next chapter of his story, Chris decided that he was going to move to Seattle, which he decided he was going to do by car. And it did not really go smoothly. It was one of the best trips I ever had. It was um, just me cruising through Canada, playing the four CDs that I had over on loop with almost no money, right? You don't want to burn all your money on your road trip. And then about halfway through, my engine started making this clicking sound. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know what this is. And my parents had freaked me out, like, be careful, don't get stuck, you're going to die out there. And so I'm like, all I'm doing is like, okay, I'll just give them more oil. So I just start throwing more oil in there. And eventually it kind of works. The, the sound stops making such a loud sound. It ended up dying about three days after I got to Seattle. The timing chain broke. And I, that's much worse than the timing belt. It's like a couple thousand dollar fix or something. So I, I got lucky because otherwise I was stuck. Well, thank you, Chris, for making it safely across the border all those years ago. And thank you very much for the conversation and the information about JavaScript frameworks. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you want to know more about this podcast, go to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast and please subscribe on your service of choice. I'll talk to you next week.